Here I'm standing by the drum barn built in the 1800s. It was located off Rifle Range Road, probably 20 miles from here. David J. Drum built it back in the 1800s, and it was purchased from Dale Drum, moved to Hart Square in 1982. Inside you see this large salt trough. Notice the tin. Well, mules and deer were actually eating the wood because it had salt in it and about to destroy it. So I put the tin on it. You'll see a lot of farm implement equipment and tools on the walls here on the overhang. And right on the, my right side here is a large peanut boil pot where we'll boil about 200 pounds of peanuts during our festival. That'll be the compliments of Brad Dozer. Okay, on the back side of the drum barn, you'll see a potting shed and a number of collection or a large collection of churn lids that I've collected over the last 35 or 40 years. Inside, you'll see greenware, and this is where the potters during our festival will throw pots and glaze them. And inside, you'll see Charlie Lisk, a well-known potter of the area. He'll show you how to throw a pot that you would have seen back in the 1800s. Hello, my name is Charlie Lisk, a uh, potter in Vail and I'm at Hart Square in the pottery shop and going to uh, give a brief demonstration on how to make pottery. Hopefully all goes well. So this is Doug Clay off of the South Fork of the Catawba River that we dug uh, a good while back and dug out of the ground. It's, uh, you wet it down and you would grind it back in the old days in a in the old mill out here, the pug mill, uh, Doc's uh, pug mill is uh, built on the old, old uh, type of pug mill, lined with wood, and in the bottom of it, it's got blades on each side, and it would be drawn by the mule slash horse, and the blades turn, and they cut the clay up to where it's workable. So there's a piece of clay. It's got to first be de-aired uh, because this has got, it's just ground and it's not exactly my, I don't have a pug mill. I got a grinder. So I'm going to step over here and show you how to de-air clay. And if not, if you don't de-air it and you get air bubbles in it, then uh, it's going to blow up. So let's get over to the wire here and show you how to de-air this. All right, there's a piece of wire here and you can see, if you can see this well, uh, you can see little air bubbles. That's where the, it could be a stick, rock, and this is natural clay, so it's got impurities in it, such. So, uh, pop. And this is smashing the air out of the clay, we hope. And you always look for little sticks and rocks. Now I'm going to wedge this. This also helps to get the air out of it. This kind of homogenizes the, the clay, you might say, a little bit. I'm going to get this in sort of a ovoid shape so it's easier to center on the wheel head, which I shall go to right now. 
now that we've got the ball of clay ready and you can see that it's you know semi-shaped a little bit to where you don't have to work it too much on the wheel head and pop her down so she'll stick and this uh this is a kick wheel that's what everybody would have used back in the the days because there was no electricity so you generally either built your own or had a somebody build it for you and so here we go now this is a uh, this is a newer wheel this is not 1800s or anything but uh and these the wheels is always counterclockwise uh, unless you're left-handed all right And this is only a three pound ball. So if you can imagine somebody taking, making a five gallon jug with 20 pound of clay, uh, that took a little bit of strength and expertise, I might say. All right, now to make, all right. The ball is centered, so now we go down to the bottom, just using the thumbs. And you can only obviously go so far until you punch a hole in the bottom, so you have to kind of measure it by eye. Smooth the bottom. All right, now I'm going to have one hand in the clay and one hand out. I'm going to pull this way to get the, the volume out of it. And the taller I pull it, the thinner the walls get. And it will only, depending on your clay, it will only take so much to where it collapses on itself. Remember I said about uh, the little pearls and stuff sticks? And I can feel one. And there she is. Now that, this is the little pearl and when you're turning, these things feel like a boulder. <laughs> Not really, but you can feel them very easily. And you want to keep the clay wet, but not uh, oversaturated. So that's the reason you go down every now and then into the bottom, which is pretty critical because that's where your weakest point's going to be nearly and wipe the bottom, clean her out, and then go again. Keep it wet, but not too wet. You can see it getting a little bit taller and the pot, the pot walls are getting thinner. And guess what? Remember that air bubble I was telling you about? Well, there it is. Yep, come on back around. Now, 
one thing I always tell the the younger ones is don't get your lip too thin because that's going to be the first place that and the handle that's the first thing you'll chip when you use it so leave, leave a nice you know not thick but you want to make it where it'll pour but not so thin that if you hit it on the side of a sink or whatever when you're washing it that you uh, chip the lip That's about 10 inches high. I'm going to be making a, I believe, a pitcher. Standard issue. And I still have to keep watch not to let it get too, too wet in the bottom. Now, this is going to be the last pull I make to try to get it thin enough that a person wouldn't break their hand pitching it up. Picking it up, rather. Now, the more I push out on the piece, going this way, the more volume you get. I'm getting, I'm gonna make this picture and I can't put a handle on it until it dries out a little bit. I'll take this back to my house and then I will put a handle on it and then burn it and bring it back over to Doc to do whatever what he wants to do with it. And that's called choking a pot. It'll give it shape. All right, I'm gonna take my chip and I'm going to go down here and I'm going to start shaping. And the chip here takes out the, uh, when you pull up, you'll leave finger marks in it. And, you know, some people leave them in, some don't. I prefer to take them out. Still shaping. And every squeak in this is my leg pushing it. <laughs> you need more speed in theory, which is not really a theory, but uh, you want to, you know, slow down because you'll sling, you'll sling it if you're not careful. If you keep, if I was doing it like when I was centering. And I could make one right after this one, and they won't be the same. All right, I told you about choking. So I'm gonna get this to where I think it's got a, a pretty shape to it, hopefully. Or somebody else will think it's got a pretty shape. And you'll see, you can see little pieces up here of clay that's sort of sticking to it. And that'll all be gone here in just a second. Okay, I've got my basic form here. Now I'm gonna go down here with my trimming stick. 
cut off a little bit of excess so she'll look symmetrical. She, because all pots are she. I never had a pot named Earl. <laughs> and here, you can, with a little tool, you can take and make a couple of little lines or whatever. You can put little, I call them ditties. Now you'll see, after I did that, you'll see these pieces of clay that are sticking to it. And I'm going to leave them right there, and they will flake off just as soon as the pot dries. But I don't want to smear them back in. And it's like when the kids are over here, and adults too, I said, well, what's one thing a pitcher needs? And the kids answer first off naturally. And I said it needs a, a spout. So I'm going to make a spout. Very simple. Just two fingers, a little smear, a little pull, and there you have a, a pitcher. Now the handle, since this is so wet, like I said, the handle will uh, be put on in, well, in a, on a pretty day like this, you could put it outside and put a handle on it in six, seven hours maybe. But uh, uh, if you cover them up, and, and you can keep a pot wet for some time if you want to with the advent of plastic. And, but uh, years ago, this would have dried and a handle been popped on it stuck it off to the side, dried, glazed, put in the kill, and burnt. It was, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of give time. And then you wash your hands off with my beautiful used rag of many years. didn't bring it right now and the other thing was how are you gonna get that thing off of there and the answer is they would use wire the old uh, use wire they didn't have nylon fishing line but then you take go under it he said go under it where the wheel go and you just slide it lateral, being careful not to lift the wire, lest it cut the uh, bottom out. Now, one picks them up gently, and uh, you don't want to, obviously, you don't want to squeeze these, unless they malform, and you set it there where it will dry. And then uh, I'll pop a handle on it, and it'll continue to dry there again. In the wintertime, it's kind of uh, tough to get them to dry with all the humidity and such, but in the summer, they'll dry pretty darn quick. And then they will be glazed, which I'm sure this is on the video. And I never saw a clean potter. Well, maybe one or two. <laughs> I'm not. And then, the end. And now Steve Aby will show how we would glaze this particular pot. Hi, I'm Steve Aby. I'm in the pottery shop here at Hart Square and today I'm going to show you all about Catawba Valley clay and glazes. Come on in. So now you've seen how a piece of pottery is turned on the wheel. Now we're going to show you how the glazes are made and how to glaze a piece of pottery in the Catawba Valley style. 
first of all, you need to start out with uh, what type of glaze that you're going to use. Uh, early in the 1800s, they were still using lead glazes on their earthenware pots. Uh, so they had to transition from using the lead because they found out that it was toxic. They started using the alkaline glaze. The alkaline glaze is made from wood ash, powdered glass, and clay. The alkaline glaze has to get a, uh, to a much higher temperature than the glaze with lead in it. When the ash is heated up to uh, 2400 degrees inside the kiln, the ash fuses with the silica that's in the clay and forms a glass glaze on the outside. The alkaline glaze is a greenish, runny, drippy glaze. It's very commonly used in the uh, Catawba Valley, unlike the eastern part of North Carolina who use salt in their glazes. So now we will mix up a glaze. The uh, formula for glazing basically consists of a 50-50 mixture of wood ashes and clay. So we'll start with the wood ashes. I'm going to use my pitcher here to get some wood ashes out. This is a gallon pitcher. These wood ashes have been sieved so that all the big particles are out of it. So we'll put one gallon of wood ash in our bucket. I'm going to put three gallons of wood ash in. The alkaline glaze consists mainly of two parts, wood ash and powdered and powdered clay and uh, I'm going to be using 50% of each and there's my third gallon of wood ash that I've placed in there and now I'm going to put my clay in. You can use uh, really any type of powdered clay. If you're uh, digging your own clay it has to be hammered into a powder uh, in a hammer mill of some sort. Uh, Berlin Craig actually used a handmade hammer mill that was water powered that would beat the clay into a fine powder. And this is my third gallon of clay that I'm adding. This clay is a very dark clay so it should bring, it should make some really nice dark green runs in the pottery once it's fired. And so now we're going to add water to our mixture. It should take around three gallons of water and we'll get it to the consistency of milk. When mixing these glazes you have to be careful because the wood ashes that's in here are very caustic. They can burn you. Uh, it's not an acid. It's actually the opposite of an acid. It's alkaline. Okay, now we're pouring the last pitcher of water into our glaze. You may ask, well, how much water do you need? Well, it, uh, the glaze has to be a consistency of milk, and uh, with years of practice on getting it just the right thickness, I know how much water to add to it. If you don't add enough water to the glaze, your glaze will be too thick on your pots, and um, the glaze will actually peel off of the pots and fall off. If you get it too thin, it may crack your pots because there's too much water and not enough glaze. So you have to know exactly how much water to add and you tell, you can tell that by the consistency. And it takes practice, years of practice really, to get it just right. So now I think that we have the glaze of the right consistency. As you can see, it's not too thick, not too thin, just the way we like it. And now we're ready to glaze the pots. This piece right here is actually what's called um, a raw piece of pottery. It's uh, been turned and dried. It hasn't been bisque fired. Uh, bisque fired means 
that it's fired without a glaze at a relatively, relatively low temperature uh, to uh, prevent it from cracking when you glaze it. But the old timers, they did it like this. They raw glazed their pots, so that's what we're going to do today. You want to dip the piece in, and as you're dipping, spin to get it coated on the inside and out. Turn it up, let the excess run off. And set it to the side and let the glaze dry. The glaze should dry. You should let it dry for at least two days before it's loaded into the groundhog kiln and fired. And we'll do another piece. You want to uh, keep the glaze stirred up because the uh, heavy particles that's in the glaze will settle to the bottom. So you have to keep it mixed up as you glaze. Dip it in, spin it around, get it coated really well on the inside and outside. Make sure it gets on the bottom. Turn it upside down and let the excess run off. And that's how you glaze with alkaline glaze. So today we've glazed two pieces of pottery here. And if you notice, these colors are kind of a dark grayish color right now. Uh, when they're fired, this wood ash and the clay will actually melt and form this shiny, green, drippy glaze. It doesn't look like much now, but when it's fired, it'll turn out just like this. Now, normally, the potter will make all the pottery at one, all, one time before he glazes. So to, to make enough pottery to fill up the groundhog kiln, normally takes about three months worth of work. So you make all those pieces of pottery and you set them to the side, then you glaze all of them in, in one day, and then a couple days later you can load them into the kiln and fire them. And when they turn out, they turn out like this. So I hope you've learned something today about Catawba Valley clay and glazes, and if you get a chance to come to Hart Square, come on out. Thanks. And now Luke Hebner is going to show us how to fire pottery in a groundhog kill constructed exactly like you would have found in the 1800s. All right, so we've got the, all the pots in the kiln. As we're loading the kiln, what we're looking for is in the front, we start lower. And going from the middle to the sides, we want the top to be higher and the sides to go lower. Now the front row in the middle is going to be lower than the second row, which is lower than the third row, which is lower than the fourth row. You can see this last row we tapered off just a little bit and then this small stuff in the back is basically really decorated things that we want to kind of be protected from the fire. But the idea of this is to get the pots coming basically graduated from front to back from smallest to largest so that it helps to keep the flame from all just going straight to the top of the kiln and coming back. As we get these larger pots in here it'll help slow the flame down and push some of the heat down into the bottom of the kiln where it's all not just coming straight up to the top and running right out and completely missing the bottoms of the pots. And that was typically the way they used to do it. And there again, it was almost a, um, almost a breast wall to help slow everything down and just keep the flame um, even from top to bottom and side to side. So we pretty well have the kiln loaded. This is not necessarily traditional, but what we've got here are pyrometric cones. Um, in the old days, they would have went strictly by the soot line in the kiln and uh, the color of the flame and the color of the pots as they were sitting in there. But just to make sure that we get it completely done, we use these pyrometric cones. What they do is after a certain amount of heat work, which is a combination of temperature and time, they begin to bend and they'll fall over one at a time, starting with this one and ending with this one. When we get this pyrometric cone just about halfway laid over, will be just about done and we can stop firing the kiln. And there again, it's just a way to help us add just a little bit of modern technology without going too far to, a, to an old tradition. We still look at the soot line, we still look at the flame and uh, look at the color in the kiln, but this is just a little extra insurance. 
So we've got the kiln loaded, the pots are all inside. We start fires in each one of the three inlet flues here at the bottom. We'll let those warm up as uh, the coal starts to build up and trickle out into the firebox. We'll start moving wood into there and slowly building the temperature up. And then uh, mostly tonight we'll warm it up, just keep a fire going in it, probably maybe three, 400 degrees, just to get all the brick nice and hot so that the kiln will draw. Uh, we'll do that through the night, somewhere about 2 a.m. We'll start going up in temperature and then continue on until tomorrow, um, somewhere after lunch and start blasting the kiln. So tomorrow, as we're just about finished, uh, the last thing we'll do for about the last hour will be to blast the kiln. Uh, the blast off is when we fill the front slap full of wood, and then you have flames that are just coming out the back of the chimney because they can't, not enough oxygen for them to combust. So as it comes out the chimney, it combusts, and that's what produces the big 15 foot flame, which is called the blast off, which is kind of the grand finale of the fire. So, when the blast off is over, we'll close the kiln up, close the front, close off the chimney. The kiln will set to about Tuesday or Wednesday. That's when we'll come in, unbrick the front, unbrick the back, and start to crawl in and start taking pots out. Um, you go in through a hole in the chimney and just crawl inside, get the pots. A couple people go in, hand them out kind of like an assembly line, and they come out and just get set out around the kiln, and everybody gets to see what happens when we fire. All right. Four days later, we have come back to the kiln to see what the fruits of our labors are. The kiln's been blasted. You've seen the flames coming out the top 10, 12 foot. Now we're gonna get the pots out of the kiln and just see what we've got after all the, all the work that's gone into it. It takes it about four days to cool down before it's cool enough to get in. There's still a lot of residual heat in there, so everything's warm. Not enough to burn you, but it's still very warm in there. Um, so let's see what we got in here. So as the pots come out of the kiln, you can see that the glaze runs down and gravel sticks to them. Now this all has to be ground off. You got to get the pots cleaned up so that they're ready to sell, uh, get them to look good. But that takes a little extra work. But in the time being, we just get everything out. And then we can make an assessment and look and see what's good and what's not. And hopefully there's nothing bad. So uh, we'll just keep getting the pots out and spreading them around and then take a look at them when we're done. 